Welcome to America's Retirement Headquarters, home of the Retirement Guys Formula and America's Medicare Associates. Securities offered through Peak Brokerage Services, LLC. Advisory services offered through the Retirement Guys Formula. Registered Investment Advisor, America's Retirement Headquarters, America's Medicare Associates, and the Retirement Guys Formula are separate and independent entities from Peak Brokerage Services, LLC. Welcome into and thanks so much for joining us here on America's Retirement Headquarters, home of the Retirement Guys Formula and America's Medicare Associates with Nolan Baker, Jeremy Baker, Scott Kirshner. The phone number 419-794-3030. That's 419-794-3030. You can also go online, find out more about the team, schedule a little time to speak with them, ARHQ.com. My name is Chris Swan. Today on the show, would a recession mean a major market pullback? We're going to talk about ways to address longevity risk when you're making retirement withdrawals and how can you effectively pass on inheritance without losing a say in who gets it, all this and more. But first, let me check in with the guys, Nolan, Jeremy, Scott. Glad to be with you as always. How are you doing today? Yeah, doing great. Uh, happy Father's Day to everybody out there. So it should be a yes. wonderful weekend. I'm going to try to get out, maybe play a little golf with the kids this weekend. Sure. Hopefully it'll be a good time. Yeah, you know, that's something we do all every, every year, uh, Troy and uh, I get out and play golf. But uh, uh, this year, um, I played some golf with my daughter. She came in town, so her and uh, Troy and I uh, played a little golf and going to have some fun. Should be a good time. Definitely a lot to a lot to enjoy, a lot to celebrate this weekend. I want to wish a happy Father's Day to you know the dads here on the show, obviously, and then all the dads out there that are listening. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we love dad so much is that no matter what the situation is, he's always there to offer advice. We actually had a chance to speak with retirement author Patrick Kelly about his father's advice, and here's what he said. I remember being a kid wanting to buy a computer. It was an Atari 400. This dates me a little bit, but it was on sale for this day only. And my dad said to me, this was not the only time he said this to me during my life. He said it over and over, and it was a great reminder. He said, Patrick, if you can find this on sale today, you will always find it on sale in the future. That has saved me so much money making rash purchases that I didn't necessarily need at the time because I was trying to get a sale on something. So it's allowed me to pause, think about it, and not ever feel like I have to do something immediately today or the deal is lost. So guys, what is, what's the best financial advice that you ever got from your fathers? Well, I, you know, I think that advice Patrick Kelly got from his dad was pretty good advice. It makes me think about my uh, purchase from uh, Amazon earlier this week. <laughs> I saw on the internet there was a heat press machine for shirts. And so my wife has got into doing a lot of the different crafting and it was a good sale. So <laughs> hopefully I got a good sale. But, you know, I think we get uh, so many wonderful lessons from, you know, our, our parents. And I can think of, you know, a couple of great examples. Number one, my, you know, dad's best friend was a financial advisor and uh, ultimately was the gentleman who got me into the industry when I was still in high school. So, you know, through dad's relationship, you know, that uh, advice from his friend got me into the business. Uh, You know, thinking of uh, the good advice that dad gave me, I started investing in the stock market when I was 12 years old. Um, So saving early, I would say, would be a good lesson I got. Um, I also became a a business owner. I've always been a business owner. I'm a veteran-owned business here, and I remember my dad telling me, um, you know, either be the man or work for the man. And I sure, you know, chose to start my own business. So lots of good advices I think we get from our parents. You know, it's crazy. Um, so my dad was a blue collar worker and, uh, you know, worked at Chrysler. And the crazy thing, I never received any financial advice from my dad until after he got advice much, much later in these years. You know, he was working in, in you know, the 401ks and the pensions back in those days. He had a pension in that. But he never really started contributing to any 401ks or anything of that nature. Um, um, I got an uncle that was in the banking industry, and he uh, sat down and talked with uh, my mom and dad and um, kind of got them into investing. And, and I'll never forget, my dad was sitting there, and we were all talking around the kitchen table, and they were saying, well, how much money should I contribute? And they said, well, put as much as you can afford to contribute and uh, take advantage of the employer match. And, um, you know, so I remember that. But one of the things, you know, dad was Santa Claus, and I've told this story many times times he passed away on Christmas Day and uh, dad always told me to to make sure you treat people right be kind to people and they'll always uh, um, you'll be rewarded uh, far more than any monetary items can can uh, reward so that was advice that my dad gave me I think one thing that 
sticks out to me my dad when i was a kid i remember we were on a camping trip and i I used to collect baseball cards as a kid and he said if you find a guy that has a higher batting average than george brett i will give you this 50 cent piece my dad knew nobody had a higher batting average than george brett because he hit 390 the only card i would find would be a ty cobb card and that'd be worth a whole lot of money but I think I think what my dad was trying to do was just keep me busy and keep me away from the crowd because <laughs> but I did end up finding a card. It was a guy he 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 was like one for two. So his batting average was five hundred. <laughs> okay. And I brought that back and my dad was like, Well, here's this fifty cent piece. Thinking about inflation, I wonder what that'd be worth today. Sure. You know, my father, I, we've spoken about this before. Uh, my mom gave me the, the the majority of the financial advice. My father, he really instilled in me, you know, a, a, a first generation generation immigrant, uh, served 23 years in the army, uh, you know, a veteran, and, and just the importance of family and, and putting that forward and, and, you know, making sure that your your family, your, your personal affairs are in order. In the same way as a father myself, one thing that my son has taught me, and kind of changing the, the script a little bit here, is uh, the power of saying, I don't know. He asks a lot of questions. So many questions. Uh, and being able to say, I don't know, but let's find out the answer. So as you're listening to the show, as you're watching online or, or what have you, you know, you may find out uh, we, we raise questions that you don't know the answer to. And that is OK if you need that financial advice, if you need, um, you know, a little bit of insight into the situation, figure out how it works for you. The team at America's Retirement Headquarters, they're happy to, to share and impart that information, that knowledge with you and hopefully give you a better understanding as you get into retirement. It all starts with picking up the phone and, and giving a call, 419 794 3030. That's 419-794-3030 or go into the website and that is at ARHQ.com. Now, retirees look for effective ways to pass down wealth to future generations. I read an article in USA Today that talked about a, quote, living trust. Guys, what exactly is that and who might need one? Is it among the options that you recommend when it comes to estate planning with clients? You know, I think having an estate plan put in place, whether it's a, a will or a living trust, is extremely important. It, really, everybody should do that. You know, when you're looking at what is the purpose of a living trust, one of the first things that is designed to do is to try to avoid probate. And, and probate is the process, ultimately, to get assets from your name into your beneficiary's name. And so, you know, here in Lucas County, where I live, um, the probate system has a cost associated with it and then also a, a process, meaning that it takes time to go through the court system if you wanted to get, you know, your house into your kid's name. Um, and because that often process involves things like attorneys who will probate this state, um, avoiding probate can be a, a much more efficient way to transfer assets. There's also times there's confusion that people think, well, you know, I have a living trust, so everything is is fine. But in many cases, what you want to think about is a living trust is like a box. And it's really only as good as what you put in the box. So you may spend time, you know, setting up a living trust, but then ultimately if you don't retitle assets like your home or your bank accounts, they may not be able to take advantage of those. Um, there is something called a pour over will, but again, you want to have things titled correctly the first time. The uh, other thing that you want to take in consideration is just because you have a will or a, a trust, um, it doesn't mean that things aren't going to go differently. As an example, when you look at things like life insurance, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, you know, those type of accounts typically have um, named beneficiaries. So in a named beneficiary situation, it's typically not going to go through your living trust or your will. It's going to go directly to who you name as your beneficiary inside of those. Um, I received a phone call earlier this week. This was from the, a daughter of a client. Uh, he had established a trust a couple of years ago, been with us for quite some time. And unfortunately, he's had a very declining health situation. So his daughter has stepped in in the trustee capacity to help him, you know, with kind of managing those assets during the incapacity. So it's able to, you know, identify, you know, who is able to make some decisions, uh, who is the successor trustees ultimately in that situation to help out uh, during those uh, incapacities. Um, a lot of times, you know, a living trust and one of the goals people want is to keep information private. Sure. I know we can go on the Internet. You can uh, read wills of famous people. So if you want to read, you know, Elvis Presley's will, you can just Google it. It's on the Internet. And in, in today's day and age, not only with theft, you know, cybersecurity and bad people, but just in general, 
I think people like to have their information private, and a living trust typically is something that's a little bit more private. Uh, could be a you know a, a good way to help in all the different areas. Um, you can get into tax planning and um, different types of strategies on what you're trying to accomplish can be beneficial from a, a tax perspective. Uh, I, I'm not a CPA. You always want to you know discuss this information with your attorney and CPA before you you make different decisions. Um, th- this is an area where it can be, I think, pros and cons uh, when setting up and putting assets inside of a living trust for tax purposes. Uh, As an example, in some cases with real estate, you get what is called a stepped up basis at death, meaning that all taxes are forgiven. Um, And that oftentimes is the case with non-retirement investment accounts. Uh, so if, if an individual has a highly appreciated stock, it may be beneficial to leave that stock to your spouse as like a transfer on death designation versus putting it uh, either jointly held together or in a joint trust. Um, I had established a trust personally years ago because of the fact that I had minor children. Sure. And my kids are still kind of young. My oldest has graduated college. Pretty responsible kid, but I was also in my 20s once. I remember how that happened. And then my youngest son is going to be a senior in Anthony Wayne. So God forbid something happens to mom and dad. You know, we have some special language set up Mm -hmm. inside of there to try to help them continue on their progress of being responsible children. And, you know, these are the areas when I'm talking to people about the difference between, you know, having some type of an estate plan, whether it's a basic will and looking at what is the primary purpose of a living trust. You know, that's one thing, Nolan, just like you, you know, when my kids were younger, it, it, I put together a a, um, a a trust as well. And, and the trust that I had was a trust kind of on a, a full blown estate uh, planning chassis. So it was. Um, it was very affordable for me to put things together. But think about this. If, if you don't have things put in place, something were to happen, um, your beneficiaries are going to get all of the proceeds, right? Well, back when the kids were younger, and this, I talk to a lot of clients that come in that have young kids or starting a family. Uh, think about this. If you have a sister or brother and they have two or three kids and all of a sudden something were to happen to you and your wife and now their family of, of five now becomes a family of seven, well, their house may not be big enough. They may need to get a new van or something of that nature. And if you don't specify exactly how those funds are distributed, they could be using your money to purchase the new van or the add-on addition to the house and things like that. And the other thing to think about is if you've got young kids and you've got a, um, you know, life insurance or, you know, a lot of proceeds that would be passed on, you know, you've got an 18 year old, 20 year old son or daughter, all of a sudden getting 2 million bucks. I mean, we all were 20 years old at one point, right? (laughs) What the heck would we do with 2 million bucks? We have no idea what we would do. So you want to make sure of that. One of the pieces of advice that I would give is talk to an attorney, make sure that you know what's going on. I had a situation with a, um, an elderly uh, family where they lost mom and and um, one life insurance policy was outside of the trust. Well, that caused a real big problem because the other four children thought that everything was divided equally, but this one policy was in the trustee's name only. And I mean, that caused a lot of problems. So you always want to make sure that you have the right things put in place. And, and um, you know, a living trust like you, I think they're very, very important to avoid a lot of uh, problems in the future. And, you know, I know in both of our situations, in fact, all three of our situations, we've all lost loved ones here. And even working with clients is just, you know, part of the business that we deal with working with retirees. So what we've done is we've put together the ultimate estate planning checklist. And within this checklist, what we've done is we've gone through and we've looked at some of the most common errors. So what you had mentioned just a minute ago, things like not having things spelled out correctly on the mm-hmm. beneficiary forms or, you know, where do you keep the passwords so somebody's able to get in the accounts after something happens to you? If it's been a while or maybe you don't have things in place or even if you got things set up and you think everything's correct, um, I'm pretty confident that going through the ultimate estate planning checklist can be a well worthwhile exercise to make sure you have everything put together 
uh, because you don't get a second chance at this. This is an area that it, those clients experienced. After the fact, it's what's in writing is what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. whether it's clear communication and making sure that it's correct, getting your money to the right people, uh, your loved ones versus your least favorite relative, Uncle Sam. And to get a copy of that ultimate estate planning checklist, it's as easy as reaching out to us at the office. I, I was just, no one touched on one thing. It was a step up in basis. I've seen a number of times where, you know, you have to look at mom and dad are older. Should I put, should I put mom and dad's house in my name as an old, as a, as a child? Um, that's probably not the best decision. And, um, the other thing I was thinking of is blended families. There's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, when if their mom and dad get divorced, and then there's other siblings, and dad didn't necessarily want money to go to the the siblings that are moms or the new moms, then that's a situation where you want to have a review and make sure you get it right. Again, making sure all those T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted is something that the Ultimate Estate Planning Checklist can help with. And to get a copy of that, just reach out to the team, 419-794-3030. Perhaps you find it during that process, you need a living trust. Perhaps you don't. You need some other form of planning. You don't know until you get that process started. Again, that number, 419-794-3030. Or you can go to the website as well. Reach out there, arhq.com. This year marks the beginning of peak 65. Over 4 million baby boomers will turn 65 each year from now until 2027. And that leads to the big question, will I be financially prepared for retirement? Guys, with that question looming large for so many people out there, is there a sort of scorecard that can tell them if they are in fact on track to retire comfortably? Well, you know, I want to jump in here real quick. I, I just want to, you know, everybody knows that I do Medicare, right? Everybody knows that. Well, in 2025, marks a big year for uh, people turning 65. And um, I, this kind of hit me personally because I'm not that far away from this, right? So everybody prior to 2025, I could always tell based on 19, you know, 54, 56, 58, 50. Well, guess what? In 2025, we start everybody that's born in 1960 turns 65 in uh, 2025. So, you know, I, I look at that, I know that's kind of a silly thing, but uh, I look at that and I think, holy smokes, right? 1960 is when we're hitting uh, uh, 65. And, you know, the numbers, 4 million baby boomers, this is the big peak 65, which I, I, I see that. I mean, I, I really, really do. Sounds like uh, more and more people are probably going to move down south into the villages and uh, continue to have <laughs> more people exactly that way. Right. Yeah. You know, that's the question that everybody wants to answer, though, is, you know, how to tell if I'm on track to retire comfortably. The way that we can do that here is what is called a, our retirement team action plan. In our retirement team action plan, we're going to allow you to be able to leave here comfortably knowing exactly what your scorecard is. What that team action plan is, is it stands for taxes, estate planning, asset protection, money management. And when we sit down and we look at these areas together, what we're going to do is we're going to share with you our observations on areas to, you know, maybe take it up a notch where we could add value or blind spots and things that you want to, you know, take a look at. So number one, we're going to look at your retirement savings program. We can take the retirement savings program and make sure that you're targeting the correct amount, uh, comparing your current retirement savings goal uh, to where your income on what you want to be. Uh, number two, we can talk to you a little bit about your income and expenses, uh, talk to you about how to create a reliable income plan in retirement time. And when you look at income and expenses, you know, having a discussion um, that falls into the next category, which is debt and liability management. Um, you know, many people we get together with still have a mortgage. And so they want to know what does it look like? You know, should I take a little extra money out of my um, investments and pay off my mortgage uh, before I retire? And I would say in, in general, being debt free is a, a good thing to do. Also in that retirement team action plan, we're going to provide you with an uh, investment policy statement 
going over the investments. And I know, Jeremy, you do a ton of work when we work together on cases and kind of getting people ready, um, going through that financial inventory, the uh, independent portfolio analysis, and, you know, helping create that team action plan. You know, what are the other big observations you go through and you take a look at when you're helping people to tell them if they're able to retire on track comfortably? I think, you know, for me, I d- deal a lot of with the number side and sort of, you know, I call it uh, going to the nerdery with my calculator and looking at uh, some things. We have some definite, we have some um, some technology tools available to us, which is like a risk allies where we identify a risk score. We can do a, an independent analysis on the portfolio, see how the portfolio is performing, look at some blind spots. We do a stress test to see if your portfolio is optimized. Um, we also use a program called Right Capital that looks at um, you know your retirement goals to see if you're on pace, if you're on track, and we can identify some some weak spots. If Social Security were to get reduced, for instance, if inflation were to keep at this rate, um, what's the investment performance that you need? You know, some people might want to get ten percent, but if you only need five percent, why take the amount of risk when you're close to or in retirement? You might not be able to recover from a, a big loss that you might have if your risk level's too high. And I think that, you know, the retirement team action plan, when you, we get that one page financial inventory or we get these other areas that you're talking about, it really shows you how to optimize things. The other thing that I like about the retirement team action plan is we talk about uh, asset protection is the A. And, and, you know, when we're looking at asset protection, uh, Scott, I know we've done uh, quite a few different events over the last month where we've had people that have come out uh, to our different events that we had, whether it was our lunch or dinner events. Mm-hmm. And there's really three areas that we take a look at there and we're looking at you know the pre-65 and how do you navigate the affordable health care you know transitioning ultimately over into medicare and then you know from a a state planning perspective and wouldn't you agree with in each of those areas the decisions that you make um they could be costly mistakes or they could be good planning opportunities to minimize cost. Well, you're absolutely right. It could be both. You know, if you do it properly, it could be, um, you know, a, a, a great move moving forward. But if you don't properly prepare and, and make the right decisions, it could be extremely costly to you. You know, I'm, uh, I, I've been working very closely over the past couple of weeks with a couple of clients that are looking to retire early and, uh, you know, looking at the Affordable Care Act and looking how, uh, you and I, Nolan, work very, very closely with your reportable income and how is that going to uh, impact your premium and your premium tax credits and things like that. So there are ways to absolutely minimize your monthly premium uh, to help you get from that pre-65 to 65 Medicare sign up by going through uh, the ACA plans. But, you know, it's very important. You know, one other thing that I'll mention is the HSA accounts, health savings accounts. You know, I've met with a couple of clients. Uh, these are phenomenal numbers. Um, I think they're great numbers, but I've got one client that's got over $94,000 in a health savings account. Um, uh, this person will never pay a um, um, health out-of-pocket expense most likely for the rest of his life based on a $94,000 balance. And I've got some other people that have got $60,000, $70,000 in their HSAs. HSAs are great tools to contribute. If you're over 55 years old, I think you should absolutely maximize your contribution. You get a $1,000 catch-up. Um, if you want to know more about HSAs, I'd be happy to help you with that. But it is definitely a, a mechanism of investing that would definitely benefit. And just to get another part of that comprehensive approach we do right here at America's Retirement Headquarters is it's that retirement team action plan. This is something that's complimentary if you have more than $250,000. Just call up, say you're from the radio show. You've heard us on our podcast, or our radio show. You, you'd want to get those retirement team action plan. We'll put that report together for you. Uh, includes, again, taxes, as estate planning, asset protection, money management, and able to help you kind of bring it all together to be able to answer that question, to tell if you're on track to be able to retire comfortably. And if for some reason over the course of that retirement team action plan, you find out there are still steps that need to be taken, it's not a failure on your part. It just lets you know how to get there, how to get to where you want to be to retire comfortably. Take advantage of this, the retirement team action plan available. Just give a call 419-794-3030. 
or go to the website right there, ARHQ.com. Bobby Lee is a successful stand-up comedian and actor. His net worth estimated at $10 million. Just don't ask Lee to confirm that number. As he tells the Ice Coffee Hour podcast, he doesn't actually know anything when it comes to his income. No, I'll tell you why I don't know. I've never asked. How, who do you have to ask? I have a money guy, and I, when I first signed him 50 years, 15 years ago, I go, I don't want to know how much money I have. I don't want to live in a world where I'm like always looking at my bank account. You curious? No. Why because I, I, because yeah. the number's really low, I'll yeah. just be depressed, and I'll start panicking. Sure. I, go, I need to do more, right? But if you don't know, then you just kind of just, I just live my life. Like, I asked my money guy, I go, you know, how long can I not work until I run out of money? And he goes, a long, long time. So you can go out a long, long time without yeah. working, and you'll be fine. It's kind of a stick your head in the sand sort of mentality, but it seems to be working for him, I guess. Guys, have you ever looked over a retirement plan where a new client was told they were good, but... When you did the analysis, you found out, well, you know, maybe not actually. Yeah, you know, that's a scary conversation to have, but it's unfortunately something that that does come up. I mean, one of the best things I think people can do is when you're within five or 10 years of retirement is really start to kind of narrow this stuff down and, you know, take more of a, a laser focused approach at identifying, you know, where you're at in retirement. And what happens oftentimes, I think in situations where, you know, people were told maybe they're not good is it's finding out what those blind spots are in retirement. Mm -hmm. And I know, uh, Scott, we recently did some events, and we have some other events that are coming up talking specifically on the topic of health care, Medicare, and protecting your assets from long-term care, because that's one of the blind spots that's out there. Um, I can think of a situation where somebody a, a couple of years ago had retired. Uh, they were in a fairly healthy situation. Let's say they retired at the age of 62, and they were just going to go ahead and uh, wing it, if you will, until they got sure. to Medicare age 65 and not go out and get health insurance because they were afraid of what the cost of health insurance was going to be. In, in their situation, they actually ended up getting hurt, mm -hmm. broke their leg, ended up uh, it had multiple different surgeries that had to happen from that. That didn't go perfect. And now all of a sudden they're buried in massive amounts of debt and they just are now transitioning into retirement time. So, you know, one of the things that you want to watch out for for a blind spot is not having a plan to protect your assets from a healthcare crisis and learning how to navigate that environment as well. And Scott, if you look at it, the other extreme, you know, go down the other end of the road, when I'm looking at planning situations, uh, having a, a loved one go in to need some type of long-term care, uh, whether that's assisted living or all the way to nursing home care, uh, in some of those cases, it can be $10,000 a month. Oh, there's no question. You know, if you, um, you know, I was talking regularly with my mom, you know, she's 86 now. And I said, Mom, you know, it might be time to kind of look at maybe transitioning into, uh, you know, a, a, a different type of home environment. You know, so there's several levels that you deal with with um, uh, long term care and long term care is not covered by Medicare or um, uh, the Affordable Care Act. It's not covered by any of that, right? The only way you're going to get coverage with long-term care is if you actually have a long-term care policy. We've talked uh, several times about that. If you'd like to know more about what we say about long-term care, you know, you can check out our uh, podcast or some of our videos. But, you know, there's different levels, right? You know, my mom is doing really well. She's, you know, by herself and she doesn't need a whole lot of care, you know, so she's a level two just so you you know, for a, a assisted living. Well, level two for her, you're looking at $5,000 a month at a level two. You know, if you transition to memory care, which is really round the clock protection, you're 10 to $12,000 a month for, for that type of coverage. You know, that will absolutely be a healthcare crisis. And if, um, you know, your, your spouse needs that kind of coverage, you have to deplete all of your assets first uh, before you look at any other type of assistance. So, you know, Nolan, you're right. If if you don't have um, that built into your retirement plan, uh, it, it's going to be blown up. Do you see people that come in? How often do you see someone that doesn't have 
the healthcare crisis or long-term care built into their plan. I think the stat that I saw the other day, and I would probably agree with this from the people that we talked to, is that 97% of people wow. don't have long-term care insurance. But I also, I think people need to realize that there are other options that's available. In fact, what our office can do is we can show you different strategies designed to help protect your assets without buying traditional long-term care. And the more time you have on your side, the more options that are available. So we could show you like a life leverage plan, an asset-based solution. Um, there's benefits for those of you who served in the military and, and the VA. And again, you know, when, when we're thinking about it, and people come to the office and I draw out the independent income system, oftentimes what I'll hear from people is they finally understand it. You know, they understand how to better manage your money, protect their assets and efficiently plan their estate. And that the healthcare is a topic in our comprehensive approach that we look at. But the other area, Jeremy, that we work on a lot is looking at it on the investment side. Uh, we had somebody who had recently come into the office. I'll just call them Tom and Sandy. And what they had is they had 100% of their money in the stock market, and they were invested in aggressive growth investments. Now, if we look at the year 2024, in general this year, the market's been pretty cooperative. And mm -hmm. in fact, for the last couple of years, if you take COVID out of it, we really haven't had a sustained downturn in the market since 2008. But the concern that I had in their situation is what is called the sequence of returns risk, meaning that if the market does have a major downturn and Tom and Sandy have all of their money in aggressive growth investments, they're going to experience a, a major decline inside of their portfolio. And Jeremy, one of the things that you do uh, when we get together with folks is you go through putting that investment policy statement together for them. And some of the metrics that you see, I think it's good when somebody's able to look at those numbers on, on what those risk alized reports look like. Yeah, when you see those numbers on paper and you see, you know, because we can look back at 2008, we can look back at, you know, times during COVID and see what your portfolio would be expected to do. And it's kind of shocking when you see a 34% decline or something higher even in COVID where once you experience that decline, you if you think about it, you have to get double the return to get your money back. And that's a that's kind of tough to do even if even if you have an aggressive portfolio the other thing i would look at as a concern and and, and we hear this once in a while um, especially with men uh, having thinking your plan is take me out back and put a gun to my head is probably not the best uh, long-term care option it, definitely not. And again, you know, avoiding some of those major declines in the early years of the market, uh, making sure that you have a backup plan. The last one that I would say is an area that's a blind spot that can blow somebody up in retirement time is not considering the impact of a premature death on the surviving spouse's income. I mean, I think we all have this, you know, rosy grand vision of sailing off into the sunset together one day. Uh, but in reality, that's not how it works out. In fact, we talk a little bit about life insurance and you know most times people think about life insurance when you have a young family mm -hmm. a mortgage and kids at home and, and that is true but when you look at it in retirement time you know life insurance can still be a very valuable tool to protect your spouse's income because when one of the two of you passes away uh, you're going to lose the lower of the two social security benefits uh, and then also in the impact that you're in a single tax bracket so things like social security Security tax rates tend to jump in quicker. Uh, the increase in tax benefits happen a little bit faster. You know, so these blind spots are what catches you off guard. And part of our job, and one of my favorite things, is trying to point this out to people uh, before something bad happens and be able to cross the T and dot the I. And in our retirement team action plan, we look for those areas to take things up a notch. Mm -hmm. I know when you put the portfolio analysis together, we look at ways to, to optimize the portfolio, but we also identify these blind spots because you know, you wanna know and get rid of them before something bad happens. And those are a couple of different things that we can do going through that retirement team action plan. And as we started in the beginning, Bobby Lee didn't know what his situation was. He just asked his money guy. Um, I think if you're a listener and you haven't looked at your personal financial situation and you're within 10 years of retirement, you should be doing that 
every year. And if you haven't done it and you haven't got a hold of your advisor or they haven't called you in the last year, we'd be happy to put that retirement team action plan together for you to see if there's any of those blind spots that could catch you off guard. To get started, all you need to do is pick up the phone and set up a time to speak with the guys at America's Retirement Headquarters, 419-794-3030. Perhaps you do have a blind spot or two in your retirement plan. Uh, That's not necessarily a failure on your part, but just by finding out about it, you're showing you're taking your retirement seriously, and it is an easier way to address it if you know what they are, but you don't know until you sit down and you speak with them. So again, 419-794-3030. You can always go to the website as well. Schedule a time there at ARHQ.com. We've spoken about the 4% rule many times here on the show. Uh, it's been around for about 30 years. Basically, you could withdraw 4% of a portfolio safely in the first year of retirement, adjust for inflation annually for the next 30 years, and uh, allegedly not worry about running out of money. But there's an article in Market Watch, guys, that says that the rule is blind to the new realities of retirement. One reason is it really disregards the fact that nobody knows how long retirement is going to last. So if the 4% rule isn't cutting it, if it Never cut it, perhaps. Uh, is there a better way to safely withdraw money in retirement yet still factor in that longevity risk? I believe so. And the process is called the independent income system. And so the independent income system, if you Google that, I have a 15 minute video that walks you through the different threats and opportunities that a retiree faces. And it's, you know, really why I believe it's a kind of a better approach when you are looking for how to plan for longevity risk in retirement. You know, the biggest concern that people have is outliving their income. And, you know, the 60-40 mix is another rule that's out there. So you might want to have 60% of your money in bonds or 40% in equities. That 60-40 rule, if you look at that, the 4% withdrawal rule, and you look at how a 60-40 portfolio has done over the last three or four years, a traditional 60-40 portfolio, because of what happened in COVID, and then you had another negative year in the market, and then you had two good years in there, you know, it was really not gone much of anywhere. And then add on top of that, the fact that somebody's pulling money off of their uh, financial accounts, it's important, uh, if not crucial, to plan for the longevity risk in retirement. Within the independent income system, some of the ways that we do that is we look at uh, making sure that you have enough reliable income to cover minimum monthly income needs. I had a couple I met with uh, last week that came out to uh, one of our events that we had over at Mansi's, and we ended up having a conversation with them talking a little bit about Social Security. And they, like most people, just assume that they were going to begin collecting Social Security uh, right away at retirement time. But what we did is we ran a Social Security optimization report. And I know, Jeremy, you do a lot of these. And running that Social Security optimization report, the decision to collect benefits early versus waiting to what is the optimal time frame was a couple hundred thousand dollar difference over the course of their lifetime and again you know we're assuming life expectancy to the age 85 you know we don't know how long people are going to live to but what we do know is the social security is a you know something that's backed by the united states government obviously that's in you know some financial turmoil but it is something that's still strong it's guaranteed for life it's inflation adjusted it has survivor benefits on side of there it's a, a strong way to build something solid in there so don't be like the 70 percent of people that ultimately draw social security early and take a lifetime reduction of benefits figure out how to optimize it because you want to look at longevity and uh, i run into guys all the time in meetings they'll be like well you know my dad nobody in my family has ever lived past 75 and i did the break-even analysis and i better get it while i can my answer back to that is i'm betting on you living right you know the technology that we have in healthcare today is uh, dramatically better than what it is let alone if you don't think you're going to live past 75 i don't want you sitting across the table looking at me you're 76 <laughs> and you're like well i wasn't supposed to be here right yeah, right <laughs> so in longevity risk to get rid of that risk social security is extremely important the other important area is to make sure you have enough reliable income to cover your monthly minimum income needs. There's a a basic amount of money that every family has to have to cover the basics. 
And again, I'm not talking the fun stuff. I'm talking the basics. And I want you to go through it, or I'll help you do this, but you want to go through the exercise of determining what is your family's minimum monthly income needs. And then from that, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract how much you're going to get from Social Security. You're going to subtract a pension. In that dollar amount, you may end up having a gap. So let's say a family needs $5,000 a month, and between pensions and Social Security, they're getting $4,000 a month. Right. They have a $1,000 a month gap to cover their minimum monthly income needs. Why I think the 4% rule or that 60-40 mix is a dangerous scenario is... You know, that gap to me, in my opinion, that $1,000 should be something that's considered to be reliable income. And in often cases, what we would do is we would utilize some type of an annuity that's protected from market loss. So this, you know, traditionally is going to be like a fixed annuity or an index annuity. So you have some type of principal protection. Some of these annuities also offer either different time frames that you can cover. So if there's only a gap of maybe four years till you get to optimization of Social Security, we can identify a four-year period. Or if you're looking to cover that income gap in this example of $1,000 a month, we can go to the insurance companies of America and contractually figure out you know, what that gap looks like. There's other strategies to look at it, meaning that you don't look at it as inflation adjusted all the time either. When we develop financial plans and we go through our planning software, one of the defaults that is out there is an inflation adjusted retirement spending, meaning that every year you're going to spend more. As you pointed out, you know, COVID has really pushed up cost uh, in different areas such as dining out. I know the three of us, when we picked up my son last week from hockey camp, we went through a drive through and fast food and it was like $54 for the <laughs> three of us. I was like, holy moly. It wasn't a sit-down restaurant. This is fast food. But the other thing that you need to factor in in uh, you know, planning for these other expenses and areas that, that come up are um, looking at the fact that things don't always get more expensive every year for a retiree. Um, my experience is a lot of times when people retire in those beginning years, while they're young and healthy, they're going to go travel, sure, you know, go down south, spend more time down there, uh, take the kids on those trips that they always wanted to do. But as you get later in life, um, your spending oftentimes can go down. When I think right. of my seventy-five to eighty-five-year-old clients. Their spending actually comes down. They don't go and travel to Florida or other places as much. Kids oftentimes come see them. It's unless you have that healthcare related expense. So if you're looking at that and you want to look at longevity risk and you're figuring out, you know, what's that best approach? Again, YouTube, America's Retirement Headquarters. Uh, you can watch a video specifically on the independent income system for those threats and opportunities. When it comes to something like the 4% rule or the 60-40 rule or the rule of 100, rule seems like a, a misnomer because it's not the law of the land. It, it honestly is an okay starting point, but you really want something customized towards you. Whereas the independent income system, it's right there in the name, independent, as, as it works for you specifically. And so to find out more about it, as Nolan said there, just Google independent income system, find that video about it. Or you can also come in and speak with the team directly and see how it all works together for you. 419-794-3030 is how you set up that time. Once again, that number, 419-794-3030. Now, it's long been said that the Fed ideally wants inflation back down to 2%, and given that we're not anywhere close there, it's not interested in cutting rates just yet. But what are the long-term effects of higher rates? This is Brett Schutte of Northwestern Mutual on CNBC. I don't think the Fed's going to be able to cut rates, and the longer that rates remain elevated, the more they work their way into the economy. And we should all remember that on average, it takes 10 quarters for interest rates to impact the economy, at least in the prior times the Fed has hiked, and we're only nine quarters into this. I don't think we're going to get out of this without a recession. I still think one is likely in the future because I don't think inflation breaks without one. So if a recession does in fact happen, do you guys see a significant pullback happening in the market? Well, you know, how much a the market drops in a recession uh, is a great question. And at the end of the day, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think long-term investors need to stop worrying about the recession. It's been a topic that's been talked about. Um, in fact, the high rates out there, there's 
some real positive things actually with high rates today. You know, the, the high rates that you have out there are, are usually bad for younger people. So my son finishing up college, you know, at some point he's probably going to go out and want to get his first house and, you know, get a mortgage. And in that situation, the high rates uh, for for him are not necessarily a good thing. But on the flipping of the scale, if we look at it for our retired clients, uh, when we look at the high rates in money market, FDIC insured CDs, fixed or index annuities, uh, those can be really positive. But in context, looking at how much the market drops in a recession, what history can do is history can be helpful in determining what a guideline is. And looking at the past and the history, it doesn't really bode well for the market. So while the market is at an all-time record high, uh, now is a really good time to be making sure that you have a downside risk management program in place. You're taking steps to protect your portfolio while the market is at record highs. You're taking advantage of these higher interest rates because there will be a significant pullback in the market. Uh, it may not be in uh, the next six months or a year, but something's going to happen. And going back and looking at the history, if we go back and look at the Great Depression, 1929 to 1939, what you saw is the stock market crashed. Uh, in October of 29, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell about 25% over two days. The long-term decline continued until 1932, losing nearly 90% of its value from the peak in 1929. But we know, looking back, we had, over the long run, the market recover. If we look at the recession of 1957 and 1958, uh, the recession was relatively short, and the S&P dropped by about 20% from 1956 to 1957. Uh, it did have a quick recovery in 1958. Uh, the recession of 1973 to 1975, the oil crisis impact, uh, again, you know, had another major decline where the market S&P 500 index fell nearly 50% from its 1973 peak. Uh, the early 1980s recession uh, kind of had a double dip recession there. And during that time frame, the S&P fell by 17% during the 81-82 uh, recession. And then it declined by another 27% after that. Uh, early 90s recession, you had a market decline. Uh, the market experienced about a 20% decline during the 90-91 recession. Dot-com bubble burst, similar story where the market uh, fell by nearly 37% during that time frame. Uh, the Great Recession of 2007 and 2009, uh, similar situation. The market fell uh, roughly 57% from its October 2007 highs. Uh, we had the most recent recession was the COVID-19 uh, recession. We saw a pretty sharp decline in the pandemic uh, caused the market to drop by a whopping 34% in just over a month. So again, bottom line, folks, is markets at an all-time high. You should be taking advantage of where these high fixed rates are and having a downside risk management program in place. If you look at your investments today and you say, I don't know what would happen if the market went down, we need to talk. You know, and having gone through, you know, several of these market downturns uh, in, in your working career, uh, you may have heard from your financial professional, oh, just hang in there, it'll come back. Historically, that is true, but here's what is different. Uh, we're now all older, we're all, all closer to retirement, and that market downturn could have a much more catastrophic effect on our balances, especially if we're already withdrawing, like we've talked about previously. So it is a conversation uh, definitely worth having, and the team in America's Retirement Headquarters, happy to sit down with you and speak with you, figure out uh, how to hopefully, you know, take some of that risk off the table and start developing that plan to get you to, through, and beyond retirement. It all starts with that phone call, 419-794-3030, or you can always go online, schedule a time there, meet more, uh, find out more about the team, ARHQ.com. I want to thank you for joining us here on America's Retirement Headquarters, as we always do, really do appreciate it. Hope you have a great week ahead of you. Hope you stay safe out there. Gentlemen, appreciate the time as always. And as we wrap up, want to leave you with the final word. Yes, uh, thank, uh, thank your fathers. Uh, love them. Hug them. Uh, very important. And uh, I'm going to leave you with this little tidbit. Uh, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. 
Enjoy the beautiful weekend. Again, happy Father's Day to everybody out there. And just remember, when you think retirement, think America's Retirement Headquarters. It's home of the Retirement Guys Formula and America's Medicare Associates. Yes, uh, thank thank your fathers. Uh, Love them. Hug them. Uh, Very important. And uh, I'm going to leave you with this little tidbit. Uh, An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Thank you all for listening. America's Retirement Headquarters is located at 1700 Woodlands Drive in Maumee, Ohio. You can reach them by calling 419-794-3030 or online at americasretirementheadquarters.com. Exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell any financial vehicle. Investments can fluctuate and when redeemed may be worth more or less than when originally invested. Nolan Baker is not affiliated with nor endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency and does not provide legal or tax advice. Please consult with your attorney, accountant, and or tax advisor for advice concerning your particular circumstance. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. By contacting us, you may be provided with information about insurance and annuity products offered through Nolan Baker, Ohio Insurance License Number 27787.